Hey everybody, welcome. Happy Friday. My name is Mark Medeiros. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at Peninsula Open Space Trust, also known as POST. And I wanted to share a little bit about POST. Before I do that, um, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the Native peoples whose lands we are on today. I am uh, joining you from downtown San Jose which could be described as historically part of Tamian territory, but in um, the Bay Area, um, there historically has been and currently um, continue to be many uh, indigenous groups we collectively call today Olone. So um, wherever you are, please take a moment to acknowledge the native people whose land you are on. So about POST, Peninsula Open Space Trust has been around since 1977. Our mission is to protect open space on the peninsula and the South Bay for the benefit of all. So we have protected almost 80,000 acres uh, in that time. And much of that is now part of public parks um, that are part of the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District, Santa Clara County Parks, San Mateo County Parks, um, California State Parks, many other agencies. Um, these parks are there for the benefit of all members of our community, um, regardless of where you come from, your culture or, or your background. Um, and as a resident of this area, I am very happy that we have been so successful in protecting all this land. And of course, that is thanks to thousands of people um, who support this work. Um, on behalf of POST, I want to thank all of our donors who um, have been contributing over the past 40 years and have made this work possible. So today we are talking about wildlife um, and wildlife linkages. Wildlife protection is a core area of POST's focus. Um, we have four major uh, themes that we focus on, the first being public access um, so that everybody could enjoy our public open spaces. We also focus on protecting redwood forests, um, local farmland, and wildlife. And this is a very interesting map um, that shows the flow of wildlife across our landscape. You see the um, San Francisco Peninsula on the left, the Diablo Range on the right, and areas that are highlighted in um, bright yellow are areas of high wildlife connectivity. So um, POST is working on a variety of projects with a variety of partners to not only protect critical wildlife habitat across this area, but to improve, enhance, and create new linkages between them. Um, and to talk about this topic today, we are going to have this amazing guy named Chris Wilmers, who is the founder of the Santa Cruz Puma Project, and um, also um, a faculty at UC Santa Cruz. Um, we're gonna hear a lot about the Santa Cruz Puma project. We have a lot of material to cover actually today. Um, so with that, I'm going to welcome Chris to the stream. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing well, thanks for having me today. Thank you so much for making the time. Um, I know we're all busy in this um, shelter in place period and um, trying to navigate and balance. So we really appreciate you making the time to do this with us. I'm really excited personally. Um, I, I wanted to ask um, for, for those who are watching, who are less familiar with you and your work, um, could you just say a couple of words about how you came to um, the work that you're doing today? Yeah, so I started um as a professor at UC Santa Cruz in 2007. And I had just come sort of fairly recently from a PhD at Berkeley where I worked on uh, the reintroduction of gray wolves to Yellowstone and trying to understand how it was affecting other carnivores in the population. And so, you know, I had always been thinking about mountain lions. And when I arrived at UC Santa Cruz and started to set up my own work, it seemed like an obvious fit. 
That's great. And I know, um, you know, within the conservation community, um, you're definitely, I don't know if I'd, I guess I could say a celebrity, you know, very well, the, the work that you're doing is, is um, really important and impacting a lot of the projects that are going on across the region. So um, thank you again. So I'm going to turn it over to you. I know you have a lot of content for us. Um, before I do that, um, I just wanted to acknowledge a couple of things, um, little housekeeping items. First, uh, I want to welcome all of you who are joining us from um, first having participated in the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District webinar uh, yesterday night, coexisting with Cougars. Um, uh, resource Management Specialist Matt Sharp Cheney, who you work with. Uh, had a great presentation going over how uh, MidPen works to minim minimize negative interactions between humans and mountain lions and all sorts of details there. So that was a great webinar um, and we're building on that today. I wanted to also share that um, for those of you who are sensitive um, to, you know, graphic imagery. I wanted to warn you now that we're going to be looking at some images that include images of injured animals, mountain lion kills. So that's something to keep in mind if you're watching today and if you might be, um, you know, sensitive to that type of content, we wanted to warn you about that. And thirdly, you know, I see a lot of comments already coming in through Facebook and YouTube. Um, welcome everybody. We have a lot of viewers. Um, so if you're on Facebook or YouTube, we will have time for questions at the end. Um, if you are not on those platforms, we also wanted to make it possible for you to ask questions. Um, so quickly take a look at that um, URL that I just am flashing at the bottom of the screen here, pollev.com slash drycreek013. That will be another place that you could submit your questions. And we have um, another post staff person, Katie, ready to transfer your questions over to chat for us. So um, so with that, uh, Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you and to your screen. Um, again, thank you. I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me again. And thanks for that nice introduction. Um, I'm not sure I'm quite a celebrity. Uh, I'd rather not be actually, um, but I am uh, uh, passionate about wildlife and, and conservation and hope to share some of the work we've been doing with you on uh, mountain lions in the Santa Cruz Mountains. So uh, before I get too far into it, I just want to acknowledge that this is really the work of a uh, you know, large group of folks um, from my lab group with a number of amazing graduate students and postdocs to a number of uh, collaborators, uh, field biologists out there in the field collecting data on a day-to-day -day basis, houndsmen helping us uh, collar the mountain lions, a pilot who helped us for the first number of years of our study uh, from the air, tracking animals, uh, great illustrator, and literally dozens, probably hundreds of undergraduate volunteers, a number of funders, and some great uh, photographers. So when we think of... Uh, large predators like leopards and lions and mountain lions. You know, this is kind of how we imagine them looking regal in this sort of beautiful, uh, unobstructed habitat. Um, but sadly, you know, the reality for these animals is becoming more and more uh, juxtaposed against this human dominated landscape where, um, you know, these large predators are getting um, pushed into smaller and smaller fragments of habitat separated by, you know, urban, rural, agricultural development of one kind or another. And so if we want to save these species, you know, we need to continue with the kind of work that POST is doing and protecting habitat and protecting linkages between those habitats. And we also need to understand um, through science, you know, what these species really need. So why, do we, why is this important in the first place? And well, there's been a lot of research over the last 30 or 40 years or so showing the sort of real importance of maintaining top predators in ecosystems. And one of my favorite studies showing this was this study in these uh, islands of uh, 
tropical forest that were created by the damming of a river in Venezuela. And what they found was that when you removed um, uh, jaguars and pumas or mountain lions from these areas, the landscape went from looking like this verdant green uh, tropical rainforest on the left to uh, this um, you know, sort of brown denuded of vegetation landscape on the right where herbivore numbers increase by you know, 10 to 100 times because of the lack of predators. So um, you know, removing predators doesn't always, but can have these fairly dramatic impacts on ecosystems. Another thing we've looked at is you might imagine that the carbon budgets of these two systems are very different. And uh, with a collaborator here at UC Santa Cruz, Jim Estes, we looked at how um, otters might similarly maintain carbon in ecosystems. And we found that, you know, when you remove uh, otters from kelp forests, uh, the sea urchins, which they feed on, um, multiply, they graze down the kelp, and you're left with what's essentially an underwater desert. And the difference in carbon between the two ecosystems um, at the time we, we published this paper, uh, you could value it between 200 and 400 million dollars on uh, what was then the European Carbon Exchange. Uh, another thing we've looked at in our lab is the link between predators and disease. And so right here, you've got this nice photo from Yellowstone of a wolf chasing a coyote. This is sort of the natural uh, order of things. Um, but when you get rid of wolves, uh, coyotes kind of uh, change a bit. And in particular, um, the removal of wolves from uh, eastern deciduous forests caused coyotes that were, you know, until the 20th century relegated to western grasslands. It caused them to sort of move um, eastwards and uh, um, take over a number of eastern states, pretty much all of them. And what we found is that when you get rid of wolves um, that naturally suppress coyotes and deer, uh, which in turn, coyotes love killing foxes. So when you get rid of wolves, the ecosystem goes from one being sort of more dominated by wolves and foxes to one that's sort of more dominated by deer and coyotes. And what happens then is that the fox's favorite prey, this little white-footed mouse, uh, drastically multiplies. And uh, Mice and deer are the sort of two elements that you need a lot of to have Lyme disease outbreaks. And so what we were able to show is that when uh, coyotes arrived in eastern states, foxes dramatically decline and Lyme disease cases go up. And so there's actually a, um, a nice article uh, stemming out of this research in this month's Bay Nature magazine, if any of you subscribe to it. Um, uh, highlighting the work of a uh, professor at UCSF, Andrea Sway, who's now looking at whether there might be a similar link between mountain lions um, and uh, Lyme disease uh, in the Bay Area. So um, my research really focuses on human development and how it impacts these large carnivore species. And when I think of human development, uh, I think of it as sort of breaking up the landscape and we biologists call that habitat fragmentation. And I think of habitat fragmentation as occurring at these two scales. One is this really sort of large landscape scale where you know, large landscape blocks like the Santa Cruz mountains that we're looking at now become separated from adjacent landscape blocks like the Diablo range to the east by highways like 101 and development along the 101. And that kind of fragmentation can have, you know, really severe impacts on populations. It can cause, um, you know, populations to become much smaller. And when populations become smaller, because they're not able to breed with neighboring populations, you start getting uh, a decline in genetic diversity, which can lead to genetic defects. And so here, for example, is this classic kinked tail of the Florida panther, which is a mountain lion that um, has uh, is severely inbred. And they, they also suffer from low sperm counts, malformed sperm, and cryptocortism, which is a condition where the testicles fail to descend. And uh, we're now actually starting to see some of these conditions in California mountain lions, uh, particularly uh, down south in, 
in the Santa Monica Mountains, but we're starting to look for it elsewhere. And I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see it. So maintaining connectivity among these um, large landscape blocks is really important. Um, and then I also think of habitat fragmentation as occurring at the home range scale. So this is like within the home range of an individual mountain lion, um, you might have intrusions of development of one kind or another, which sort of serves to break up their home range and creates a number of sort of challenges for these animals to survive. So here we are in the air looking down on the Santa Cruz campus and Santa Cruz, city of Santa Cruz beyond it. And you see sort of how the landscape um, how that sort of level, how that fragmentation starts to manifest. Um, you also have, you know, busy roads, like in this case, Highway 17, uh, bisecting habitat. Um, and that fragmentation can lead to injuries. Here's a animal that we call 36M, and you can see that a lot of hair has been removed from his back. This was um, an injury he sustained uh, crossing Highway 17. He was likely hit, dragged, removed, you know, a uh, square foot of skin from his rump, but miraculously, you know, he survived and, uh, you know, six months to a year later had fully healed up. Uh, here's a more recently sort of uh, hit deer, similar thing happening, um, but not all animals are fortunate to survive. And so a number of these animals will get hit on these highways and, and die. Um, another kind of more insidious problem with habitat fragmentation is disease. And in particular, in this coyote and bobcat within, you know, half a mile of my house in Santa Cruz, uh, these guys are suffering from mange. And we're now seeing lots more mange in these animals because of uh, the widespread use of rodenticides or rat poisons which uh, work their way up to the, the food chain and to these uh, medium and large uh, carnivores. And it makes, it weakens their immune system and making them more susceptible to mange. And then uh, a particular problem for mountain lions is, is uh, depredation. And in particular, uh, goats and uh, to a slightly lesser extent sheep, um, uh, mountain lions really can't resist a goat. and um, Often landowners will have pens that keep the goats from going in, from, from leaving, but not mountain lions from coming in. And so mountain lions will frequently get into trouble uh, over depreda depredating um, people's goats. So what do mountain lions eat? I, I often get this question. And here's a little quick demonstration of uh, uh, st stop motion sort of uh, picture that was picked up of mountain lion killing deer. So mountain lions are these ambush predators and their diet is, is predominantly deer. That's sort of what they're built to, uh, to feed on. Um, this is a, a pie chart of 266 or no, uh, over well over 300 um, uh, kills that we documented by mountain lions that we had collared uh, in the Santa Cruz mountains. And you can see that about 76% of what they kill are deer. Um, and then the next two items are, are really raccoons and house cats that they eat a fair bit of. And then everything else is you know, quite small in its representation. Uh, from the puma's perspective though, um, you know, they really mostly eat deer because if you, um, if you multiply what they're killing by how much meat they're actually getting from each one of these animals, you know, 95% or more of their calories are coming from deer. Uh, they get a little bit from pigs and, and raccoons. Um, and they would get more from goats, but, you know, sadly, when they kill goats, um, uh, they often get um, uh, legally depredated by the landowner in return. And so uh, they, they don't actually kill too many goats, but that's where they get into trouble. So we might ask, you know, do humans, sorry, do pumas fear humans? Um, people often ask me that, uh, are they scared of us? And, um, you know, maybe not from, uh, from this little vignette here. What we're looking at on the left is a photograph, or, or sorry, an aerial image of um, my office building at UC Santa Cruz in the circle. And then uh, this yellow, uh, 
yellow arrow pointing at the tree under which this mountain lion uh, killed a deer one summer afternoon. And there I am uh, posing with the deer and there's the mountain lion, you know, feeding on it the next night. And that's my office building in the, in the background. So maybe they don't fear us. Maybe in fact, this mountain lion is stalking me because he didn't like the fact that I put a tracking collar on him. Um, but, you know, we wanted to actually test this scientifically, you know, do pumas or mountain lions fear people? Uh, by the way, I use, I use puma, mountain lion, cougar interchangeably. Um, they, mountain lions exist from Southeast Alaska all the way to the tip of South America. And so they've got the largest latitudinal gradient of any uh, mammal in the world. And because they've lived over, they live over such a large range, um, they've picked up a, a number of different names. And so puma, mountain lion, catamount, panther, these are all the same animals. Uh, panther can be used interchangeably with uh, uh, jaguars and leopards as well, but um, uh, all those other names refer to the same species. Okay, so here was our experiment. Um, what we did was we went into mountain lion kills and we set up a, uh, a camera system that was attached to an MP3 player and a speaker. And when the mountain lion would come back to feed, we would play the sounds of either frogs, which was like our control, or people talking, which was our treatment. And so here's a little demonstration of that. Uh, here we have a mountain lion in the rain. He's stepping over a cached deer that he's killed. And here's the control. We've got our frogs playing. Mountain lion doesn't really seem to care. And now here comes the humans. And there goes the mountain lion. So if you recognize the voice there, that was Rush Limbaugh. And uh, uh, the results were that mountain lions um, didn't like people. Pretty much every time we played the sounds of people. Uh, you can see here uh, in this left panel, pretty much every time they fled upon hearing the human and they almost never fled when they heard frogs. So this gave us some confidence that pumas actually fear people. And uh, I'm sure some of you are wondering, well, do they just sh sh fear you know, um, pundits on the right or do they also fear pundits on the left? And so we actually played, um, you know, partisans on the right, on the left, and we also played some nonpartisan uh, people sounds to them. And they were totally nonpartisan in their fear of people. Uh, didn't matter if it was a man or a woman or someone on the right or someone on the left, mountain lions ran away from them all. And then once they'd run away, it would take them longer to come back if they'd heard a human than if they happened to run away from a frog. And then all that conspired to them feeding for about half as long after they'd heard people than when they'd heard frogs. And so, you know, that's the ecological effect is that the mountain lions get less food. So how do mountain lions respond to that? Well, we looked at whether uh, mountain lions change their behavior near kill site, at kill sites near people. And what we did is we took a few hundred kill sites from mountain lions we had collared in the Santa Cruz mountains, and we examined how close those kill sites here as, uh, as stars, how close those kill sites were to uh, human dwellings, denoted here with these little gray dots. And um, we looked at how mountain lions behaved when they were close to people. And what they would typically do is they would feed in the wee hours of the night and then move away uh, during the day. And in, conversely, when they killed something far away from people, they just stay at the kill uh, you know, morning, noon, morning, day, and night. And um, so here's a sort of example of a, a kill close to people. Um, here's some mountain lions feeding a kill. And uh, the upshot of this all is that because they leave those kills um, for parts of the day, they don't get as much food from them. 
and that causes them to have to kill more. So mountain lions that kill um, at higher housing densities, it you know can kill up to 75 deer a year, whereas those sort of living in places with little to no humans are killing about 50 deer a year. So the impact of having humans in your territory is to increase how many deer you kill a year by up to 50%. So the next thing we wanted to understand was, okay, well, that's, you know, one thing if there's a humans talking near someone's kill, what happens if you've just got sort of humans walking through a forest? And so we took, um, uh, we took, two one square kilometer grids uh, in the San Vicente Redwoods on the west side of the Santa Cruz Mountains and another one in the uh, Sierra Azul on the east side of the Santa Cruz Mountains. And these are both places where people were not allowed. Um, uh, so there were, we could sort of do an effective treatment and control. And for each one of these places we played, uh, we set up a grid of 25 speakers, 200 meters apart playing either the sounds of people talking or frogs croaking for a month each. And then we set up uh, cameras throughout the grid. And we also um, put tracking collars on all the mountain lines that use the grid and sampled their location every five minutes. And this is what we found. Basically, mountain lions, when uh, there's frogs, don't really care. They'll walk right through the grid. But on the other hand, when there's people talking, they tend to sort of bounce off the grid and walk around. If they did happen to go through, they would move through much more cautiously. Um, so that's this result that I just showed you here. They tended to avoid the grid or move more cautiously. And then we had two ideas about how the rest of the food chain would respond. Uh, in particular, we thought that the smaller predators, um, they might like it that mountain lions aren't there and so be more sort of precocious. Or conversely, they might fear humans just as much as mountain lions do and, and stay away. And then rodents, we also looked at, um, we predicted would respond, you know, uh, in an opposite way to the smaller predators that feed on them. And so indeed what we found was that all the predators we looked at uh, did not like humans. So they all became either sort of uh, less abundant or, uh, change their behavior in one way or another to avoid humans on the grid. And the, the rodents in particular, uh, deer mice and, uh, and uh, wood rats, uh, both became a lot more precocious. They doubled their home range sizes and they became much more, uh, much less fearless in exploring for food. And so this sort of image sort of demonstrates what, you know, the forest looks like without humans in it. You've got the predators out roaming around, doing their thing, and the rodents basically, you know, uh, moving around fearfully undercover in these very small sort of little areas. You put humans in the forest just talking to each other, and the, the predators make themselves scarce, and the rodents come out and uh, do their thing sort of unencumbered over a much wider area. Okay, so... Um, how does this fear that mountain lions have influence where they go? So what I'm showing you here is a map of the Santa Cruz Mountains with uh, a number of different mountain lions plotted over there. Each color is one individual mountain lion. And uh, uh, this is just to sort of give you the sense that, wow, it seems like mountain lions are everywhere. Um, but indeed, while, um, pretty much anywhere in the Santa Cruz Mountains, you have natural vegetation that's not sort of totally cut off from other areas, mountain lions will come through, but they roam around in a very special way. And this is, uh, this is the west side of Santa Cruz uh, near where I live. And what you can see is that they totally avoid the meadows um, and they only sort of walk um, uh, where they can walk through cover. So high shrubs or trees, um, but almost never in the middle of a meadow. Um, now, mountain lions do get into sort of trouble sometimes and occasionally will sort of walk into a downtown urban area. Here's a place on the uh, um, east side of the Santa Cruz Mountains near Los Gatos. 
where this mountain line you can see walks up to Highway 85, um, walks through some people's backyards, spends the night on the edge of Highway 85 because there's like a 20 foot concrete wall there that can get over, and then wanders back into open space the next day. Nobody ever saw, saw it or reported it or anything, and no one was the wiser. Um, that's not always the case though. Um, here's another example where you can see our collar being shipped from Germany to Santa Cruz. And then we go and put it on a animal near Big Basin State Park. It, it roamed around there for a few months with his mother. And then the animal, when he was, you know, about a year and a half old, he disperses from his mother. He goes off trying to find a, uh, a new territory for himself. And he gets to the 280, he crosses 280, gets into the Los Altos Hills. Apparently it's not urban enough for him. And he walks into downtown Mountain View and he finds himself on this corner here at about five o'clock in the morning, sun starts to come up and he said, oh, I better go across the street and hide behind a bush. This is the bush that he hid behind for you know 12 hours or so, a busy street with you know cars and bikers and pedestrians. And then at about six o'clock in the evening, he makes a run for it. Uh, and the police finally sort of, you know, uh, respond and get him locked in this sort of covered parking garage. Um, the Mountain View police, um, you know, they're in Silicon Valley. They're quite social media savvy. They start instantly tweeting about it. Possible mountain lion sighting seen with a radio collar around its neck. Do not approach. More info as we have it. And then normally uh, when police or others want to try to get in touch with us, they would email us or give us a call. But this time uh, we started getting tweeted at Santa Cruz Pumas trying to reach you. We have a collared mountain lion maybe related to your work. Um, I wasn't quite savvy enough to receive this tweet, but somehow they got in touch with us and we were able to, to come there out there and help out. Um, but then, you know, quickly after tweeting at us, they um, they created a hashtag, and once they created this MV Puma hashtag, um, then it all sort of blew up in the Twitter sphere. And uh, Julia Vasquez responds, "Sheltered in place, and we have a hashtag. Exciting night in the Silicon Valley." And Nancy writes, "Helicopter looking for a mountain lion in our neighborhood." MV hashtag MV Puma. So you start to get the sense of what it's like there. People are being asked to shelter in place. There's a helicopter going over. And this is the scene that is, that's there when we get there. And uh, this is the parking garage that the police had um, isolated the mountain lion in. Uh, luckily, with zoo grade steel bars. Um, and so uh, Raj Matai writes, mountain lion spotted in Mountain View. Mountain View PD with guns drawn near Rangsdorf in California. And then Track writes, uh, Mountain View PD cornered MV Puma beneath a car in an apartment complex. That's my complex and it's probably my car. And then here's the mountain lion uh, cowering underneath this minivan. And wouldn't you know it, but the mountain lion all of a sudden pops up on Twitter with his own account. And he writes, this game warden guy has a weird looking gun. Why do you think I'm under the car? Um, you guys, they've got me surrounded. So the PD police department was great to work with. Um, we were able to you know, safely anesthetize it, get it um, loaded up in the back of our truck. And then we had this like four car siren escort back into the mountains where uh, we were able to safely release him. And then here he was caught on a game camera um, a few days later, and he's back on Twitter, once you know it, glad to be back out in the open space in Soft Hills. That city concrete is murder on the pause. Humans call me 46M, but my friends call me Rory. Uh, and then Sam Wheatley writes, we should use the MV Puma hashtag to organize a block party. This is the most contact I've ever had with my neighbors. So, um, you know, this was sort of a fun event, but not probably so fun for 46M, the mountain lion. And so, you know, it just sort of goes to show about how we need to be thinking about connectivity. And I just wanted to share the results of a study that we published a couple of years ago. This is work that was led by uh, 
Kyle Gustafson and Holly Ernest at the University of Wyoming and a number of us in California participated in. And what this is showing is a, a map of uh, California mountain lions and how uh, how their populations are, how we can view their populations is revealed by the genetics. And what this is showing is that these, these different colors, like the central coast of California or the central south coast or the central north coast, these animals are all breeding with each other much more than they're breeding with the adjacent colors. And there's no real reason that that should be true, except for the fact that these areas are all separated by, you know, major highways of, or human development of one kind or another. So, you know, what we think is that human development has really sort of chopped up these populations into these isolated fragments from each other. And that's enough of a concern now that um, uh, the other thing you can look at is within each one of these these populations, you can look at what is what what we call the effective population size. It's not the true population size, but you can roughly think of it as the number of breeding adults. And there's a there's a, a theory that comes out of population genetics that says that you need about 50 animals in to avoid extinction in the near term and 500 in the long term. And if you look at the effective population sizes of these populations, you see that like in the Santa Monica Mountains, for instance, you have an effective population size of 2.7, uh, where we are in the central course no north, uh, effective population size of 16.6. And so the problem is, is that these animals are so closely related to each other genetically that if a novel disease or something came in, it could wipe out the whole population very quickly because there wouldn't be the genetic, genetic variability to respond. And so based on this paper, uh, the Center for Biological Diversity proposed listing the mountain lion population from the Bay Area south to the Mexican border um, as a state threatened species. And the uh, Fish and Game Commission voted uh, a few weeks ago um, uh, to look into that. And so they're provisionally threatened now, and in a year there'll be a final vote to determine whether uh, they should stay threatened. And if they do, this would um, greatly help with uh, mitigating and preventing further erosions of connectivity between populations. Okay, so now that we're talking about connectivity, um, there's really three areas of the you know Santa Cruz Mountains where connectivity is is a, a, a major concern. That is the one these these three purple areas. So the first one I'm going to talk about is Highway 17, and here um, we've we've done uh, a lot of coloring of mountain lions and developing these models based on their behavior to predict where mountain lions would cross Highway 17. And so what we do is we, we, we look at a number of behaviors. So we look at what we call survival behaviors like movement. This is just where they move on the landscape. We look at feeding. These are places where we find where they feed and we can do that by finding clusters of GPS locations. We go there, we find the remains of the prey and that tells us where they're feeding. And then um, we're interested in their reproductive biology too. So mountain lions, uh, the males make these scrapes in the ground. They go around, they sniff them, they see who else has been there. This is sort of how they patrol their territories. They also lay down pheromones, which the females will come and check out. And that tells the females how much they wanna breed with this male. Here's another male scraping. They also have a gland in their cheek, which they'll sort of express by rubbing it on you know, logs and sticks. And then when the female comes along, um, if she likes what she smells, she'll start caterwauling. And the caterwauling, the caterwauling will pull in the male and then they hook up and they'll spend, you know, two or three days with each other breeding and, um, and, uh, walking around on the landscape and then that's it. And then, you know, three months later, uh, the kittens are born and the female will sort of stash them away in what we call a nursery site, which is, you know, under some sticks and a thick bush or something like that. Uh, and these nursery sites are, you know, generally fairly isolated places. And then uh, at 
six to eight weeks, she'll start moving the kittens around from, uh, from kill to kill. So she'll kill the deer. She'll go back to the last deer, bring the kittens to the new deer. Then she'll go out and hunt again and like that. And then eventually, you know, the kittens are about her size, uh, a little bit more boisterous than she is. And then she'll start cycling back around to these scrape sites, who she wants to see who she wants to breed with next and, uh, you know, send the kittens on their own, out on their own. So we can find these communication sites by again, looking for clusters of GPS locations, but in this case, separated by a couple weeks. Um, and then we can find the denning behavior from the GPS data. You get this sort of star-like pattern with the nursery site and then with trips to these different uh, kills they've made. And with all that, we can then ask, how does the built landscape, and in particular, human structures, buildings, and roads. So each road here, I'm just showing the sort of commuter roads, and then each brown dot is a building. And then we can ask with statistics, what's the sphere of influence of each one of these buildings on the likelihood of mountain lions exhibiting each one of these behaviors? And then we can draw maps like this that show those probabilities. And this is sort of what how mountain lions view the landscape when they're feeding and moving. And these white areas are basically where they don't care about humans at all. And then when you go down the color ramp, they start avoiding them more and more. And that's what it looks like when they're feeding and moving. But when they're denning and communicating, engaged in these reproductive behaviors, you see that these white areas are much more restrictive. So these white areas are really crucial habitats to conserve. Uh, for the mountain lions. And this white area over here is where Post recently teamed up with uh, Semper Virens and the Land Trust of Santa Cruz, um, Save the Redwoods League, and uh, purchased the San Vicente Redwoods, uh, 8,000 plus acres of um, redwood forest to protect. Um, and so then what we can do is we can, we can we can sort of assume mountain lions are trying to get between these reproductive areas. They move through the landscape uh, like this, and we can combine those two together to sort of build a model that predicts how they're going to move across Highway 17. And so this brown sort of stuff is where we predict they're going to cross. The dots are actually where they did predict. And then there's, so there's two main areas. One is this area around the Laurel Curve on the Santa Cruz side of the mountains, and the other is by the Lexington Reservoir. Uh, on the, the east side of the mountain range. And so um, the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County has protected land on both sides and is working with Caltrans uh, through uh, to, to put a tunnel under the Laurel Curve and then Post and Midpen are working together in the uh, this Lexington Reservoir uh, area to create another um, crossing structure for wildlife. Um, so moving on to um, these last two linkages, this linkage now that we're looking at is the Coyote Valley. And um, we thought we would figure out where mountain lions want to get out of the Santa Cruz Mountains by collaring a bunch of these dispersal males. And what you can see is, yeah, they roam quite a distance, but they actually never leave the Santa Cruz Mountains, at least not the ones that we were able to collar successfully. This is just zooming in on the Coyote Valley up here, and you can see this guy came close but never crossed. And so we decided to, uh, uh, you know, in consultation with Co Post, to move to a different critter, the bobcat, to try to understand how the plumbing of the Coyote Valley really works for wildlife. And we put on uh, tracking collars that adjust their, their frequency of taking a location based on the animal moving. So when the animals are moving, they take a location every couple minutes. And if they're sleeping, they wait a few hours between locations. And so that way we're able to sort of just use the GPS data itself to inform, you know, where animals are crossing. And so this just gives you a sense of, you know, looking at a couple different animals, how that data really shows you where they get close to roads, fine scale of where they move across. And if we look at all the animals that we collared in the Coyote Valley, and we just sort of draw lines between points, we get this image that looks like this, and you can see there's this real sort of funneling point where animals are all crossing the Coyote Valley at this Fisher Creek culvert on Monterey Road, and um, and this is where all the action's happening. This is where there needs to be sort of more effective crossing structures, 
And also where Post has focused on acquiring land in the Coyote Valley with uh, the city of San, San Jose and this really major deal that uh, is going to sort of take what is essentially this little funnel of movement and expand it over a much larger area so it'll be better for, um, for, for, for bobcats and other wildlife and then do some revegetation that will uh, attract mountain lions to crossing the valley as well. And then lastly, I just want to point out that the other place that mountain lions can sort of get in and out of the Santa Cruz Mountains is uh, in the far southeast point near the town of Aromas. This is a mountain lion that we had collared that tried to cross there, but his collar went dead just as he tried to cross the 101, um, which is where this 156 sign is. And we think that he basically got run over and his collar stopped, stopped working. We did the same thing there. We collared a bunch of bobcats. And you can see there's really no connectivity across the 101 there, which implies that um, you know uh, we really need to work with Caltrans to get a better to get some kind of wildlife crossing infrastructure. And then um, the Land Trust of Santa Cruz has also just acquired the Rocks Ranch, which is uh, just south of the 101 here. And so now they'll be sort of you know. Um, uh, connectivity from the Santa Cruz Mountains to the Gabilin, which hopefully will be restored. So that's all I have for you today. Um, if you want to visit us, please do so at santacruzpumas.org and uh, be more than happy to uh, take some questions from you guys. Great, Chris. That was, that was amazing. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I, I, and walking away from that with a little bit of a better understanding um, of how mountain lions impact the overall um, food web and ecosystem. You know, we talk about that a lot, but some of those details that you were sharing about, you know, um, human activity um, impacting the movement of predators and how that impacts, you know, um, rodents, for example, that that was something new for me. Um, so I'm, I, I'm sure a lot of other people are feeling similarly that they learned a lot. Um, so thank you. Um, we do have time for a few questions. Um, we have some really great ones already. Um, but if anybody else wants to ask a question, we'll try to get to a few in the next few minutes here. Um, one uh, kind of theme of the questions that have been coming up a lot um, from people is this question of whether mountain lions become desensitized to human contact. Um, and do we know anything about that? Um, uh, you know, the more the mountain lions that are adjacent to, you know, um, urbanization and, and a lot of human activity, do we know anything about how their behavior changes? Or are we still learning about that? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, uh, you know, certainly if we were to like put a speaker with people talking next to them for days and days, um, they would they would get tired of it and just be like, "Ah, oh, it's just some stupid speaker." Um, uh, but you know, do the more importantly is do they um, do they like, habituate to real people talking and doing their thing? Um, and, and we don't know. Um, you know, one of the things is that mountain lions in one way or another end up dying at the hands of people. Um, that's whether they get, you know, shot at because of retaliation for killing someone's goat or, you know, in other states hunted or run over by someone, you know, humans pose a real danger to them. So that's real, unlike the speaker. Um, and so, but, but I think there is potential for habituation. We haven't seen a huge amount of evidence for it in our data set yet, but I think there is the possibility that some of these parks, particularly that have huge numbers of visitors, um, that there is the potential for habituation. So the, that's actually something we're gonna start to look at in conjunction with MidPen is whether some of these places like Rancho San Antonio, where you have mountain lion habitat with a huge number of visitors. Um, there's similar parks in San Diego County where there have been some 
indications that mountain lion might be becoming habituated. So that's sort of a topic for future research. Great, thank you. Yeah, so, um, and I'll just mention before the next question, you know, uh, Chris talked about San Vicente Redwoods, Coyote Valley, and wildlife crossings um, on Highway 17. Uh, a reminder that those are all areas POST is actively working to support our public agency partners um, to protect new lands, to you know improve the situation for mountain lions and and other species. Um, a, a kind of general question here: uh, a, a few questions about bobcats and coyotes and um, mountain lions and their interactions. Um, can you just say a little bit about like how much those different predators share the same territory and like any interactions between them? Yeah, so mountain lions definitely kill coyotes. Um, in other studies, mountain lions have been documented killing coyotes quite, quite extensively. In ours, we've only seen it a few times. Um, uh, I, I think it, it really depends on the sort of context of what kind of habitat you have. Um, <laughs> bobcats and coyotes uh, are competitive with each other, but seem to coexist fairly well. Mm -hmm. and, and mountain lions don't seem to kill bobcats all too often. Mm -hmm. they, they do occasionally, but not not very much. Great. And so I think the, this next question, it's worth reiterating. It was something that was talked a lot about in the MidPen webinar from last night. Um, but the question is about minimizing negative uh, interactions between mountain lions and people, um, especially if you have property um, or animals. So um, can you can you repeat some of those points? You know, the the main things I remember is you know you should pen your animals. Those pens should have a roof on them because mountain lions could jump very very high. Um, you should bring in food at night, including dog food. Um, any other uh, tips for people who live on the urban fringe and how they could be um, like wildlife friendly and minimize negative impacts and interactions? Yeah, I mean, those things are, are super important. Um, you know, really, the urban fringe is, is an area where we see less problems than more sort of exurban, rural kind of places where you have more mountain lions in general and you have more people with livestock. And so, um, you know, if you do have goats, if you can pen them at night and something with a roof, like you said, there's no fence high enough that can keep out a mountain lion. Um, you know, that's really the best way to mitigate things. Um, it's not foolproof, but it's a lot better than not doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll, I'll mention also the, um, importance of not using rodenticides. Um, I know, uh, that's a topic that our friends at, you know, save LA Cougars and, and other groups talk a lot about. So, um, you know please be be mindful using any type of rodenticide is going to impact all sorts of predators um, including mountain lions bobcats coyotes raptors um, so that's an important point that you should spread the message about in your neighborhoods too um let's see maybe yeah. one uh-huh no i was just gonna say that's really about you know if you have a rat problem it's really about um uh, controlling waste on the one hand, so, you know, don't give them access to your garbage. And then on the other hand, you know, um, try not to give them somewhere to nest. So if you have shrubs or something like that, try to keep them, you know, pruned up like a foot off the ground. And then that'll prevent them from sort of having a good place to nest. That's a, that's a great um, tip there. That's awesome. Yeah, let's see. Um, yeah, so I think the last question here we're going to take, because um, we're getting close to time, um, about when a mountain lion is caught um, near humans, there's an incident, 
you know, and you're able to capture it, um, how do you choose where to relocate it? Is there any thought process strategy there established or is it different? Yeah, if, it were, if, it were, if it were up to me, um, <clears throat> I would, uh, I would basically just try to relocate it to within what I thought its home range was would be. So, um, you know, the nearest open space that you have landowner permission to relocate it. Um, you certainly don't want to cross like a major freeway um, or some kind of, you know, barrier like that. Um, that's sort of my thinking. Great. Awesome, Chris. Well, that was incredible. Thank you so much again on behalf of Post for your time um, and for all of your work. Um, I'm going to quickly flash the URL for the Santa Cruz Puma project again on the screen. And this is also an organization that you could choose to support and donate to. So um, if you're inspired by this research, you know, informing all the work that Post and other um, nonprofits and agencies do, you could certainly support um, the project by going to santacruzpumas.org and um, learning more. Um, and I'd also like to mention we have other events coming up too. Um, next Wednesday, we'll be interviewing um, the tribal chair of the Amamutsun tribal band, Val Lopez, about the work um, that they are doing, their history and collaborations with um, posts and other groups. So mm -hmm. definitely encourage you to catch that and other um, events in the future. And with that, Chris, um, thank you again for joining us. I hope you have a great weekend. And I hope everybody who is watching um, has a great weekend too. Well, thank you very much, Mark. All right. See you later.